with you later. Uh, so the suffering Christ, the doctrine of the suffering Christ uh, resonated in Thessalonica. All the Greeks uh, were moved and touched by the magnanimity of Jesus, uh, the benevolence of his love. They were moved uh, that a God could come from heaven uh, and die for his people because according to them, uh, they are pagan gods who would never do that. Say, no one will do that for you. No one they are pagan gods, Zeus and Hercules and all those fake pagan gods uh, would never die for anybody and they were moved by the fact uh, that there's a God who can come down from heaven uh, and die for me. <laughs> ah, and then after Paul revealed this to them, uh, there was a rapid growth which exploded in that church. Uh, ah, we are told that the entire Thessalonica gave their life to Jesus and he even mentions to us uh, that the chief women, multitudes of powerful business women gave their life to God. Uh, and the rapid growth of that church uh, intimidated the Jews and the Jews who didn't believe uh, organized a mob of unemployed young men uh, to find Paul, to kill Paul. Uh, so they went looking at Jason's house. Uh, a young man called Jason because he was so close to Paul. Uh, say your enemies, your enemies shall be my enemies. Uh, Ah, you inherit the enemies of the gift you associate to. Uh, there's some people who are going to hate you because of your church. Uh, there's some people who are going to hate you because of where you worship. Uh, so they came after Jason and they said, Jason, uh, where is Paul? And Paul wasn't with Jason. And they took Jason and they wanted Jason to get arrested. And Jason managed to survive. Uh, and he came out of court. He looked for Paul and told Paul, uh, leave this city because they want to kill you. Uh, and Paul had to leave at night. Uh, in the middle of the night, Paul had to depart from Thessalonica. Ah, ministry was tough those days. Say ministry was tough those days. <laughs> ah, so imagine this is the scenario here. Yes. Uh, when Paul is writing this letter, he's writing this letter because he has just started a new church uh, and he's only preached three church services. Uh, ah, he's only preached to them three times uh, and he's had to flee overnight uh, and he's left this new baby church uh, in a hostile environment. Uh, so Paul is writing to a baby church uh, and worried are they going to be able to survive uh, after just three church services. Imagine, uh, you've been saved for three weeks and your pastor has to leave uh, and they're just a baby church uh, and they're being persecuted so Paul has to encourage them to stand firm uh, ah, look at your neighbor and say stand firm Listen to me in here. You might never know the whole Bible, but if you get master standing firm, you will make it. If you can know just how to stand, hallelujah, to stand in the middle of a desert, to stand in a place of no opportunities, to stand while you're single and lonely, if you can just learn how to stand in God and trust God. Ah, you are going to make it. Ah, the devil's afraid of Christians who can stand in the fire. I need some folks in this church who know just how to stand. I don't know much about Leviticus. I don't know much about Numbers. I don't know much about the tabernacle of Moses. I don't know much about eschatology, but I know how to stand. Uh, when someone dies in my family, I know how to stand. Uh, how 
when business is crazy, I know how to stand. Uh, when I'm feeling low, oh, I know how to stand. Look at your neighbor and say, can you stand? We need believers who know how to stand. Uh, after the devil has given you a punch, uh, you've got to know how to stand. Uh, through the blood, through the sweat, uh, you've got to know how to stand. Uh, ah, it is evangelist T.I. who said, still I stand. Uh, no matter what, still I stand. Uh, no matter what I go through, I stand. No matter who's with me or against me, I stand and I believe in God. I stand through my pain. I stand through my doubt. I stand through limitation. I stand through backbiting vultures. I stand through the snakes. I stand through the scorpions. I stand through the pain. I somebody in here who knows how to stand. Uh, Mira stand. Uh, ah, how many of you know how to stand in here? I need you to give God a praise if you know how to stand. Ah, you got to know how to stand uh, because life will throw you curveballs. Uh, life will throw you punches uh, and you got to know how to stand. Uh, so to help them stand, uh, Paul is going to use the doctrine uh, of the second coming of Jesus Christ. Uh, so the context of the second coming of Jesus Christ uh, in this text is used as a form uh, of encouragement to help them uh, keep standing firm in the faith of God uh, despite the bad situation uh, happening around them. Uh, and what happens is many times uh, when we hear the second coming of Jesus, uh, many times it's presented in a context of fear, uh, in a context of pain. Uh, uh, but the second coming of Jesus uh, is a place of hope and faith. Because the second coming of Jesus is an expression of God's power. It's an expression of God's superiority, yes, over all the kingdoms of men. I've come to tell you in here, the fact that Jesus is coming, it means that there's no political system that's greater than Jesus Christ. Ah, Jesus is coming. Uh, say, Jesus is coming. When you think of the fact uh, that Jesus is coming back, uh, it makes you understand uh, that there's no political organization uh, that's greater than God. Uh, because in the middle of your election, uh, Jesus can show up. Uh, in the middle of any situation, Jesus is coming back. It's not for you to be afraid. The person who should be afraid is the devil himself because the second coming of Jesus is a promise to us that no matter what happens in the earth, at the end of the day, we will win. The concept of the second coming is not for us to be afraid. 